So hi there, I'm Mike Tremezzi. I'm here with Eric Ress to talk about a better player experience, how blockchain stands to improve how we play games. A little bit about myself, I'm the VP of Token Economics at Forte. Prior to this, I led the strategy group at Kabam um, as we scaled the game, as we scaled the company rather to an international gaming concern with over 500 million uh, players uh, prior to the sell in 2017 to Netmarble and 21st Century Fox. Uh, like Eric, my background originally was in finance, where I was doing equity research and investment banking prior to switching over about 15 years ago to consumer internet and uh, uh, technology uh, for the likes of Yahoo, CBS, Interactive, uh, Fox, and Apollo Group. And I'm excited to talk to Eric today about blockchain in part because we both work together on Kabam. Uh, Eric has an amazing history in the gaming space, and I myself come at a lot of these propositions from a data analytics, data hound perspective. And I know Eric does as well. So uh, I think we have a lot of interesting things to talk about uh, the arc of gaming with respect to blockchain. Eric, do you want to provide a little bit of background by yourself? Yeah, I mean, I've been in the industry for 20, 25 years, uh, depending, on, depending on how you calculate it. It's kind of split between both investment banking and research, and then also working in the gaming industry. I uh, spent seven long years at Electronic Arts, uh, and obviously two years at Kabam, where I met Mr. Tamezi here. Um, and then I've also spent about 10 years uh, doing investment research covering the publicly traded names for investors like hedge funds and long-only mutual funds, et cetera. Now I have a consultancy where I kind of do a bit of both. I pro provide co consultation for hedge funds and long-only funds on the publicly traded companies. Uh, and then I also do a little bit of consulting for industry players like Amazon, uh, Sega, FunPlus, and also spend quite a bit of time with Warner Brothers these days. So I also do a weekly podcast, uh, Deconstructor of Fun, which gives me a plan platform to rant about current industry news. Um, and you know, my focus has always been kind of uses like utilizing market data to understand the market and anticipate consumer demands for products, and um, basically providing uh, you know providing analysis on 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 data and predicting kind of how many units of Call of Duty are going to sell every year, how their services are going to go, and basically doing this across all the publicly traded companies. Right. And so uh, it's a little bit sort of played out cliche, but I think both at Kabam, when we work together, and now so much of um, understanding the industry is understanding some of the dominant trends. And so when you're speaking with um, some of the companies you're helping to advise or you're trying to educate hedge funds in terms of what's actually happening in the industry, what are some of the... Th themes, what are some of the trends um, uh, you surface to them at this moment? Well, currently, I think the big buzzwords of the industry are kind of like the social network, uh, user-generated content, cross-platform play, software as a service. Uh, these are the big four that I kind of keep, keep hearing over and over again. And if you need the most recent ones, you can always get a full dose of that from any venture capital press release for these investments that they're making. Um, but you know these big trends are kind of the the things that are driving uh, the big publicly traded companies, and also again a lot of these new companies that are being invested in by the, the VC community. So quickly, just to give you a really you know quick overview, because they're very both all very kind of complicated you know trends in some ways. But social um, is basically the building of communities around games. You know whether it's Discord, YouTube, Twitch, esports, etc. It's like in the history of gaming, we were limited by couch co-op, and now the internet has created the ability to build huge communities around games, and that, that is something that's continually being developed and, um, and built out. The second one is like user-generated content. So, so just mm -hmm. on that social piece, that social piece, you, you also talked about communities. That social piece encompasses communities that exist outside the game. So um, people that have a tremendous amount of fandom for a particular title, they're building communities with the likes of Discord and other communication tools um, outside of the actual game itself. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. In, inside and outside of the games, yeah. depending on, on what kind of game you're, talk, game you're talking about. You know, guilds are also a big part of that. And, and you know, Discord groups, of course, outside of the games, etc. So, um, anyway, the second one is the user-generated content piece. And this is primarily geared, kind of focusing on Roblox and Minecraft, but there's also things like The Sims, where they have a huge community of people building uh, items for The Sims game. And fundamentally, this is basically the, the, the studios or the developers uh, providing tools in which the consumers can build experiences within the games um, and share it with others. 
Uh, and there's a lot, we are seeing a lot of investment in this space, including companies like Manticore. Uh, also Epic and Fortnite are also working to get into this space currently um, with their tools and technology and user base. Um, the third thing is cross-platform play, basically simply allowing customers to play whenever, wh wherever they want. Um, Epic and Fortnite definitely have accelerated this, uh, the adoption of this because they've been just pushing this. This is something customers have been wanting for a long time, but some of the uh, consoles and Microsoft and Sony have been kind of hesitant to embrace, uh, but now it's kind of like table stakes. And I think there's a huge opportunity for to expand this and, and basically allow crossplay by taking advantage of the uniqueness of each of the platforms. Um, and then finally, the big, really big one is the software as a service. Uh, and this is a really broad term, so I'm not going to really go into the big details around this, but fundamentally it's delivering the initial experience, but also providing content and live services to keep the consumer engaging, engaged, and also keep them spending. And I think FIFA and FIFA Ultimate Team is, is a really good example of this. And so on that point, um, you know, I think so much has changed in the past 10 years with respect to monetization and software as a service. And I, I think that they're inextricably linked, software as a service uh, and some of the monetization trends. And I think that when we think about blockchain, it's kind of hard to discuss uh, where the arc is going if we don't know where it sort of uh, maybe not necessarily begin, but begin, but where it has been. So uh, with that in mind, over the past five or 10 years, what do you think some of the changes are with respect to uh, monetization and um, uh, again, it's sort of inextricably linked to uh, gaming as a service. Yeah, well, one of the big examples is FIFA and FIFA Ultimate Team. So uh, 10 years ago, basically FIFA sold just the packaged goods component um, and they were able to drive maybe $50 per customer, you know, on average. Um, and currently now with Ultimate Team, they're driving close to $100 plus per, per, uh, per customer. And what was interesting about this is it almost happened by accident. Um, as far as the story that I was told was that EA was discontinuing this uh, PC FIFA manager project product that was in, I, they must've been around for like 20 years. Um, and the head of development for that team was, was, uh, was asked to create a mode within FIFA using the same systems. And that's how basically Ultimate Team was born. And now the business is like almost a billion dollars a year or more, sorry, more than a billion dollars a business a year and I'm hoping that he's getting some kind of royalty on that one because that was a huge, huge boom for EA. And so fundamentally it went from a standalone product service to a product plus an additional service over the year of the, of the, uh, of, of the season. And it's just, it's generating insane amounts of money. And during that time, it also grew as a franchise in terms of how many units it sells on a yearly basis, expanding to different, uh, geos, et cetera. So huge, huge, huge software as a service, uh, um, product for, for EA. And what's interesting about what you just said is that you just said that um, it almost was stumbled upon by accident. And so uh, imagine, if you will, that such accidents could be designed explicitly against or designed for. And so like hold that thought, we'll revisit it when we start talking about uh, blockchain. But there's one thing I want to talk about um, Ultimate Team just for some of the uh, viewers that may not be familiar with the mechanic. And correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially it's very similar um, to sort of characterize it simply, it's similar to, say, baseball cards, uh, the old baseball card packs where you you essentially buy uh, baseball card packs uh, with hopes of um, having one of your favorite players in there. But in the context of FIFA, you could actually use those players uh, in-game. And there's a lot of um, cards are rare. Uh, some are exceptionally rare, but there are a lot of common cards. So it's really the pursuit of your favorite players. And FIFA is a little bit different in that you have utility and, and you can play with them that drives some of that incremental spend. Is that sort of a fair characterization? That is, a, that is a very fair characterization, and it's also uh, what I would consider a pay-to-win mechanic, where that if you want to be competitive, you need to spend an acceptable amount of money in order to build the team that would be competitive in multiplayer. So that's a really key component of this game versus some of the other games like Fortnite and others that are not pay-to-win. And so uh, that was on the monetization front. Similarly, on the UGC front, the user-generated content front, uh, what have been some of the trends, or rather, what how, what has been the evolution over the, say, past five or ten years? Um, the two games that kind of have the most massive success here is uh, Roblox and Minecraft. Roblox has about 100 million active monthly users, and Minecraft has about 125 million. Um, we are also seeing, again, some investments um, in 
other companies that are trying to up the tools and technologies to build more compelling worlds. Um, Manticore is one of them, and then also uh, Epic. Uh, Mr. Sweeney's grand vision is to create um, similar type of user-generated content worlds with the Epic launcher and the Fortnite uh, engine, um, and basically to build the next metaverse, you know? So the, to summarize, like the, the vision of these companies in general is to create kind of the metaverse similar to movies like Ready Player One, and hopefully not in the dystopian future like Ready Player One, but they want to basically create a world in which you create an avatar, which is a virtual representation of yourself and explore, experience, transact in a virtual world that has been built by both developers and players. And so this, this original vision was actually built by a snow crash uh, back in the early 90s, I think. And, 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 but now we actually have the technology and the infrastructure really to, to, to develop this type of, uh, of, of world. So, um, yeah, and it's interesting. I was thinking about blockchain and, and, and how blockchain could actually help facilitate these trends um, and also help kind of build economies around these, these opportunities, particularly on, on, the, on the metaverse type concept. So uh, that's why part of the reason I was really interested in doing this talk with you is just to understand exactly how blockchain could be used uh, to help facilitate this stuff. Right, and so with that in mind, I think that um... Uh, as I think the conference has highlighted, there's a lot of different flavors of blockchain. And um, for the purposes of this discussion, I think it's important to distinguish between, say, uh, blockchain and gaming and uh, token economy within a game. And so what blockchain in the context of gaming means is that there is um, a record of all the transactions and a record which effectively can't be altered. So the record of the transactions uh, essentially uh, leaving a, a trail as to how an asset in a game has changed hands. So I bought the asset off a developer and then sold it to another player. That player then has kept it and then maybe sold it after a period of time. So it's like a record, which is effectively immutable. Uh, but what I think is far more interesting is the token economy within a game. And what that essentially means is the set of rules that governs uh, how an economy works in a game. It is no different than, say, the set of rules that govern how uh, the physical economy works. And the rules govern what we as individuals or we as um, entities, participants in the economy, can do. And so what that means in the context of blockchain uh, or blockchain gaming is that uh, token economy means that, uh, number one, it allows for the uh, verification, verification of authenticity for the different goods. And this is really just... Uh, function of the blockchain ledger, if you will. But what I think is really important is that um, I think uh, unlike uh, in the physical economy where there's, um, in the physical economy, you have uh, different people that can, just, that can uh, verify the authenticity of products. In a digital economy, you need that same level of authenticity and the, the blockchain itself provides that. So imagine, if you will, as a player, you want to um, procure the gear that was used in um, an esports tournament by your favorite player. Like this is the mechanism which essentially serves as an autograph to assure you, as a potential consumer or fan, etc., of this collectible that is in fact real. Uh, the second big advantage is that uh, the players actually own the asset. So what that means is that the player owns the asset in game, but they also own that asset out of the game. They can take that asset asset with them. So imagine, if you will, using the ultimate team example from FIFA, players or individuals own the players as part of their ultimate team and they can port those players with them and they can sell them on marketplaces um, and essentially they can uh, use it as they would like. So they can trade them, craft them, etc. But in a, as part of the economy, they could actually, you know, it could help control the rarity and the uniqueness of the individual players and the cards, um, you know, allow more tight control over the economy so we don't see you know, some more more protections, I guess, from the investments of the players. Is that kind of the idea? Uh, well, you would have a clearer sense. And so that sort of ties to the third point in that it, it, it supports true peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, through a multiple different mechanism. So peer-to-peer -peer trading via, say, an order book, no different than, say, how individuals trade on a market where there's a bunch of uh, individuals that are uh, listing an asset, a bunch of individuals that are buying an asset and there's consensus as to what constitutes a fair price or people can trade an asset, a super rare asset versus like an auction mechanism. So no different than Christie's, right? Where um, people uh, put an, an asset on an auction and over uh, the asset has a specified duration at, and at the end of the duration, the person that bid the highest would procure that asset or there could be um, uh, 
automatic, automatic uh, liquidity provided by a market mechanism. And so you see that in the markets all the time, where essentially a principal trader could buy an asset on part of players. But the, the, all of this to say is that when you allow for ownership and you have a marketplace, then the market dynamics will start governing what people regard as being rare and what people regard as being extremely valuable versus what people regard as being relatively common. And I think a de developer can clearly influence this by the number of assets of each type that's minted, but ultimately it allows for the players to express themselves what they find to be valuable, right? Yeah, I mean, I think peer-to-peer -peer trading has been quite a bit of a challenge for some of the publishers to implement. I think FIFA, Madden, NBA 2K do a reasonable job, uh, but all have challenges managing it properly. But it's games like Diablo 3, which was an absolute train wreck. You know, Diablo is probably the best, worst example of a poorly designed player auction system, a system in which they ended up scrapping altogether. But they basically did the design the auction house and it did the opposite of what they intended. <laughs> to put it simply, they created more incentive to play the auction house than they did to play the game. And then they, and they didn't have the controls to, uh, to change that, so they scrapped it. And of course, the goal of any Diablo game, as all of us know, is to kill enemies, earn loot, find upgrades, repeat. And basically the auction house completely disrupted that core of the game. So as people spend a lot of time farming games, items, or weapons, whatever, uh, you know, having an efficiently designed marketplace for trading could be huge, but hugely beneficial for lots of different types of games, not just you know, the sports games as well as the RPG games. Right, and having the economy, or rather the marketplace design being at the forefront rather than um, somewhat of an afterthought. And just to your point, though, about FIFA and NBA 2K, and I play both those games, and NBA 2K more so than FIFA, uh, but I will say that um, uh, some of the marketplaces uh, and some of the sort of offline activity that goes on, including selling of accounts, it's, it's sort of geared towards maybe a player's uh, different life cycle. So what people are maybe... Uh, more inclined to stop playing the game, they're more inclined to engage in some of these activities, whereas what I'm referring to is a player through their entire life cycle can engage with peer-to-peer -peer trading, and it can really complement the early part of their gameplay in addition to their elder gameplay as well. And so um, in addition to sort of trading assets, what I think also blockchain is really unique, uh, or gaming, uh, the token economies and games is really unique, is that it also could allow for the trading of services. So imagine, if you will, me as a player, I'm providing you with tokens in exchange for a service. And that service could be um, anything uh, you could sort of think of. And what's really important is that the ability to trade for a service is calcified as part of the rule set of the economy. So I can uh, play with you, Eric, and I can sort of, I could I transact with you for uh, a play along, uh, a guided uh, raid, if you will. Uh, some time, uh, if using the NBA 2K um, example, uh, time on the block top, on the block top where you can like help me uh, improve my play style, right? But this is like a formal part of the economy, no different than, say, services are a formal part of the physical economy. Yeah, I remember in the early days playing World of Warcraft, there was a lot of uh, sites where you could go and have them play your character, and it was just completely hack it, hacked at the time and uh, caused all kinds of issues with uh, players getting their accounts robbed and taken away. So. Having a system like that would have been super beneficial at that time. And, yeah, right. And in addition to sort of trading for services, you could also, uh, players can transact for yield. And uh, what that means in the context of gaming is that there's a lot of games that, roll, that essentially have, uh, I think, strategy games. Uh, you know, uh, think of your favorite sort of tower defense games, which um, essentially have a bunch of different resources that are required to build um, different buildings, and the, the better buildings you have, the more sort of powerful your base is. Uh, imagine, if you will, you can use those resources like rock, uh, iron, etc. Instead of spending that iron, you can effectively invest that iron for more iron, right? I mean, it's like, I think it, 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 it uh, allows for another layer of strategic decision making that for the right set of players in the right genre, they would find appealing. And it just expands the metagame. Gotcha. Right. And so um, similar to all the different sort of transactional rules, uh, some of the other rules of a token economy could describe or they could outline essentially uh, how different assets are distributed to players. And I think, as we know, in, in free-to-play, some of the, the majority of assets um, accrue to those that are willing to spend. And... Uh, a healthy ecosystem consists of people that spend, but also 
people that are incredibly loyal, uh, people that are uh, trying to build up your community. And what a token economy does is that it allows for those players with those actions to be the recipient of some of the most valuable goods, some of the most valuable digital assets. And then the, those players themselves, once they procure those assets based on their loyalty or their skill or any sort of like proxy for engagement, deep engagement, can then uh, play with those uh, assets or they could uh, trade them to, the, to other players who maybe are less engaged but have deeper pockets and thereby creating almost a perfect um, Pareto trade. If these are old uh, fan parlance, if you will. Yes, I, I remember that, that from back in the day. And so, and you know, tied to that, uh, the, the token economy can also dictate sort of rewards and incentives uh, for the different players. And so when you think about a healthy gaming ecosystem, what are some of the things that you think players um, do to contribute to a healthy ecosystem? I mean, the critical thing is basically participation and then also competition. You know, in order to build a community around a game, you need a loyal audience to participate, but then also you also need uh, really competitive users to really keep driving the game forward. Um, and yeah, you basically need both. Right. And so with blockchain and token economies, you can incentivize players, you can also um, penalize players. And so uh, all those points I sort of outlined, right? I mean, they're really the basic building blocks of an economy. And the point I sort of want to make, tying back to some of the themes that you had outlined, and some of the themes you had outlined were around social, UGC, gaming as a service, meaning it isn't an a la carte experience, it's a prolonged experience, and um, cross-platform play, is that with those themes, players can essentially do everything, uh, or as they can uh, interact fairly deeply with their product, um, they can uh, form communities in the game, outside the game. They can create uh, in games. But the one thing they can't do is they can't participate in the economics of it all. And so, uh, again, the things what I sort of outlined are economic building blocks, but they're really the building blocks for community economics. And I think one of the things that distinguishes um, token or games that have a token economy versus traditional games is they allow for that broader economic participation among not only the developer, but also the players. And so, sorry, uh, what, uh, the one point I wanted to make is that uh, you talked about FIFA, and I think, again, FIFA's a great game and, and it's been wildly successful, but if you look at Metacritic and the scores of FIFA, uh, it scores barely above one on a scale of one to five. And so clearly for a, a, a wide swath of the player base, the economic distribution isn't really working for them. Yeah, I mean, I think in those cases, there's a lot of vocal minority that just does not like the uh, pay-to-win mechanics in these games, yes. Right, and so uh, with some of the things that sort of outlined in community economics, et cetera, where, uh, in, in your view, uh, how do you think, uh, what do you think of the sort of community economics theme as a natural continuation of the four themes that you had discussed? No, I mean, I think it's 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 a it's a building, particularly for uh, for for these virtual worlds that are people are building. There's needs to be a way of of transacting with each with between players and also between the developers. And I think there's certain uh, value to having a system in which you could manage and 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 operate efficiently and effectively uh, with these communities. Right, and uh, just to sort of bring it back to the Roblox example, you you talked about a little earlier, and I'm a big fan of Roblox, but with Roblox, you see the power of how big a title can become when you start giving some of the participants a little bit of agency in that platform. And so I think that Roblox, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Roblox was around in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2007. And um, I believe the Builders Club, which allowed for uh, some of the builders to then uh, be able to withdraw some of their, um, essentially, sales in that ecosystem, that happened uh, in 2013, 2014, if I recall correctly. Right, right, and they're, and they're continuing to build that and, and attract more and more developers to the platform and expand their demo and, yeah, continuing trying to improve uh, uh, the, the payouts for their you know, most active uh, developers, you know, player developers. Right. And we're sort of seeing just, um, you know, the power, I think in my mind, of like the inklings of uh, the power of giving sort of participants economic agency. And uh, despite, uh, I think, 
uh, what, what some could argue as being a relatively high transaction tax. Um, and imagine, and you could sort of imagine that it would be somewhat lower in the context of a token economy in which uh, developers are incented to build uh, an economy versus being a little more transactional focused. Right, and make it more equitable for different types of players, I guess, would be the ultimate goal. So, right. So maybe improve kind of the, 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 the perception of some of the player bases for these games as, as less toxic and more uh, collaborative with people that want to spend and the people that don't want to spend. So that yeah. makes sense. Well, especially when we talked about a little bit earlier about the idea of like uh, rewarding and penalizing. And so uh, when you consider the uh, strange witch's brew that is toxicity and how certain environments become toxic, I think that um, I think you need both. I think you need both the carrot and the stick uh, to um, affect the toxicity of a, of a game community. Um, and I think this has the potential to do both of those things. Cool. Sounds really interesting. I'm uh, looking forward to seeing it implemented in some games going forward. Well, so on that See note, right? Yeah, on that note, so uh, when you consider this, the trajectory of free-to-play mobile gaming, right? So uh, free-to-play games, in, so uh, iPhone was out in 2007, and maybe 10 years later, in 2017, the market was 50 billion. And it almost, free-to-play free -to spend in mobile games across all platforms, 50 billion uh, globally. And so it started from nothing, and then it grew to that point exponentially. And so uh, who knows what the trajectory of gaming or, or blockchain and gaming will look like. But I think that um, if uh, the past of the prologue, I think some of these platform changes and some of these innovations, once they sort of start taking hold, I think that um, the pace of adoption is pretty quickly. Right. I think that's all the time we have, but really interesting to see you know, how this evolves. But uh, and there's going to be plenty of opportunities to implement these type of uh, you know, economies going forward in games. Great. Well, I appreciate uh, you spending time discussing this, Eric. As always, a pleasure. I look forward to hearing about uh, this and Deconstructor of Fun. Sure. We'll bring it up. Great. <laughs> Have a good one. Yep, thanks.